January 1916, the second winter of the war. On the Western Front, the Germans were preparing a new offensive. Its code name was Gericht, Judgment. An offensive needs supplies. This was just one of ten new railway lines that the Germans were edging forward, sleeper by sleeper, rail by rail, scalpels cutting into the heart of France. A few miles away to the west, ten miles behind the French line, lay their objective, Verdun. Verdun was the great fortress whose name had for centuries not ceased to haunt Germanic imaginations. It was the great advanced citadel of France, the principal bastion of her eastern frontier, whose fall, resounding throughout Europe, would efface forever the victories of the Marne and the Isère. In 1914, before the Battle of the Marne, it had stood like a rock against German assault. Had it fallen, Paris, even the war, might have been lost. It was the hinge and pivot of the whole Allied line, jutting like a huge elbow into the German positions. On the map, Verdun's defences looked formidable. Between the town and the front line, ten miles to the north, were a ring of forts, some twenty large and forty small ones. Strongest of them all, cornerstone of the whole system, was Doulmont. Forts like these had been built to be impregnable. In fact, Verdun was one of the weakest points in the whole Allied line. In the previous summer, French general headquarters had begun to strip the forts of their guns. By now, January 1916, over 200 guns had been removed from the forts for mobile use elsewhere, together with a vast amount of ammunition. There is no evidence that the Germans knew how weak the forts were. Their decision to attack Verdun was taken for quite different reasons, and it was taken by one man, General Leutnant Erich von Falkenhayn, chief of the German general staff. In December 1915, he had written to the Kaiser, The strain in France has about reached breaking point. A mass breakthrough, which is in any case beyond our means, is unnecessary. Within our reach, there are objectives for the retention of which the French general staff would be compelled to throw in every man they have. If they do so, the forces of France will bleed to death. Falkenhayn's directive to the staff of the German Fifth Army spoke only of an offensive in the direction of Verdun. There was no mention of capturing the city. But the Crown Prince William, the Kaiser's eldest son, who commanded the Fifth Army, had other ideas. The objective is to capture the fortress of Verdun by precipitate methods. It was this discrepancy in interpretation which was to cost Germany dear. 140,000 men were assembling for the attack. Entire villages behind the lines were evacuated to make room for them. Most impressive of all were the guns. The guns that were to do the bleeding white. The guns came from as far away as Russia and the Balkans. Siege mortars, naval guns, quick-firing guns, field guns, mine throwers. 1,200 guns in all. And to supply this fearsome armory, 1,300 munition trains. Two and a half million shells. With the greatest secrecy, the build-up continued through the damp days of January. On the other side of the lines, alarm at the state of Verdun's defences had at last penetrated to general headquarters at Chantilly. And the French Minister of War, General Gallieni, wrote to the Commander-in-Chief, Reports have come to me, indicating that in the Verdun region, the line of trenches appears not to have been completed. Should the enemy break through, not only would your responsibility be involved, but also that of the entire government. Joff replied, Nothing justifies the fears which you express in your dispatch. German planes patrolled the forward area in strength, waiting to pounce on any French reconnaissance planes. They had complete air superiority. They had assembled the greatest concentration of air power ever employed in war so far. 168 planes at Verdun and a large number of observation balloons. 
Even Joff became apprehensive. Our minister to Denmark telegraphed that a German offensive was being talked about. This was immediately confirmed by news from Switzerland of the concentration of 400,000 men in the region of Verdun. A regiment of engineers was immediately sent to Verdun to strengthen the defences on the east bank. Time was running out. German deserters were crossing the lines in ever-increasing numbers with stories that all leave had been cancelled, that something terrible was about to happen. Men, and still more men, marching towards Verdun. They were old hands, these men. Old hands of 25 or 30. Many already wounded in action, toughened by two years of war. Westphalians from Minster, Düsseldorf, and the Ruhr. Men from Hesse. Descendants of those who had fought as mercenaries against Napoleon and for him. Brandenburgers from Berlin, one of the elite units of the German army. Three of the crack army corps of the German army, 72 battalions. Their wait was a fearful one. On February the 11th, the day before the attack, Verdun's treacherous climate came to the aid of the French. The attack was postponed. It gave the French a little time to improve their defences, to settle in two new divisions that had just arrived. These men, like the Germans, were veterans, young men grown old before their time. Poilu, the French public called them, the hairy ones. It was a nickname they disliked. Few of them fought any longer for such noble aims as the recovery of Alsace and Lorraine. They fought for the remaining land of France. And so they waited. 34 battalions of them, 30,000 men. Ill-prepared, outnumbered by over two to one, and by much more in guns. The hour is near. In our wood, the front trenches will be taken in the first minutes. My poor battalion, spared until now. The dawn, February the 21st. Twenty miles behind the German lines, a Krupp's 15-inch naval gun raised its barrel from its camouflage netting. For three hours, the German heavy guns ranged on Verdun itself. At seven in the morning, the bombardment switched to the French lines. One heavy battery to every 150 yards of trench, and to the roads leading up to them. Gun after gun joined in, 1,000 in all, all firing onto six miles of the French front. To the French, cowering in the woods of the East Bank, the air seemed solid with whirling fragments. The shells appear like great ghosts, axing the chunks, mangling the branches into hanging shreds. The crude iron of the shells shattered into huge ragged chunks that sometimes two men would be unable to lift. Men were squashed, cut in two, or divided from top to bottom, and blown into showers. Bellies turned inside out and scattered anyhow. Skulls forced bodily into the chest, as if by a blow with a club. Here and there in the front line were a few men who by chance escaped. In all our minds we had the same thought, that everyone to right and left had been killed. A German airman reported, It's done. We can pass. There's nothing living anymore. A young Hessian scribbled a last note to his mother. There's going to be a battle here, the likes of which the world has never seen. The Germans had eight miles to go. Their fighting patrols slipped forward like a dentist's probe. 